All right, welcome. This is the, uh, I guess it's the 12th, is that right? Yeah, the 12th um, video for digital systems design. And we're in the middle of uh, finishing up the uh, review of logic design. Um, we'll take a, let me shrink this down, or let me pull this up. Let's see, we'll do, so here's the, here's the, um, Yeah, we'll, we'll do this. We'll shoot me over here. Okay, so here's the the uh, syllabus. And uh, so you can look and see. Uh, so we are here on the 21st, right here. And that will be our last review. And then Wednesday we'll do the test, uh, the logic uh, design review test. Uh, so... Um, so that's coming up. And let's see, I think probably I have in here somewhere how the, the percentage that that counts. I don't remember, but I think I do. Yeah, so, so we'll have at least two midterms, and they count, so seven points. Yeah, and it'll, you know, I'll probably grade it fairly, you know, it won't be, it shouldn't be that stressful for you, okay? All right, um... So let's see, let me get rid of this too. Uh, all right, so let's pick back up with our slides. And I'll shrink down my little window here so I can still kind of. And then something like that. All right. Okay, so. So when we do a, a sequential design, we basically look at the problem definition. We do a state graph. You can also do an SM chart. I will cover SM charts eventually here. And uh, we're going to use SM charts in DSD. So pay, uh, make sure you really pay attention to that. If you don't remember SM charts, make sure you review that. Um, so we, we want to make sure that we understand the relationship between the inputs to the outputs and, and, uh, and how many states that we may need. And we drive that state table and figure that out. Are we are are we more likely uh, construct a state graph and then use the state graph to create the state table, uh, or we do an SM chart? And if we do an SM chart, uh, we don't even necessarily need a state table. We can go straight to the equations from the SM chart. Uh, but you don't always get the advantage of uh, state reduction or uh, or uh, using don't cares. Uh, so it depends on how you're doing it. All right, um, there are there are um, there are two ways we can reduce the state table to a minimum number of states, and one of them is to if we have a kind of a problem where you input a fixed number of inputs and reset, then uh, we can eliminate redundant states for that type of problem. Uh, otherwise, we can do what's called an implication table, uh, and we can look for equivalent states, and then we can combine those. Okay. Um, so then once we've reduced the states in the state table, we can decide how many flip-flops at a minimum it's going to take. Now we don't have to use the minimum number of flip-flops. We can use more than the minimum number, such as if we use a one hot state where we have, uh, let's say we have 10 states, we have 10 flip-flops, and one flip-flop only is on for each state. Uh, this approach can, uh, can have some efficiencies associated with it. Um, because uh, even though we have 10 flip-flops, the numbers are, are all, everything, all the other flip-flops are at the zero state except for the one that's on. And, and so some of the drive circuitry can be simplified because of that. Anyway, once we decide how we're going to do the flip-flops, we substitute this in and we get a, trans <clears throat> a transition table where, we, where our previous state, uh, S1, S0, S1, S2, so forth, are replaced by how it's being encoded with the flip-flops. Uh, if we have four flip-flops, then that would be an A, B, C, D code, whatever. And then we take those, we plot the next eight maps. Um, and if we're using D flip-flops, then we're done. If we're using a different kind of flip-flop, we may have to develop input columns as well, uh, uh, the flip-flop input columns. And if we're using RS or, J, or, uh, RS or JK, then we may have to have two columns per flip-flop because each flip-flop in that case would have two inputs. Um, 
this this uh, this can be an issue when we want to implement it with a ROM. We really we really need to use D's uh, because if you use JK's or RS's, uh, the ROM has to have uh, has to be larger to, to include those additional input inputs for each flip flop. And then using K maps or whatever method we want. Uh, we can build the input equations and then minimize them. And then that basically then allows us to put the hardware together and then we can uh, check our design by either signal tracing by hand or we can do uh, a computer simulation if we're using an HDL or we can do actual laboratory testing by building a test article and then exercising it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about redundant state elimination. Uh, this is the one of two methods for reducing our state table. This only applies when you have uh, a problem that inputs a fixed number of inputs and then resets each time after that fixed number. Um, and what we do is, uh, in this case, we input a sequence of uh, one, two, three inputs, and then we reset. Uh, well, actually, I guess, uh, yeah, one, two, three, yeah. So three inputs and a reset. So, uh, and here are the, all the possibilities. Now notice that uh, what you do then, you're looking for redundant states. So you're looking states that have the same next states and the same outputs. Well, all these states have the same next states, but a couple of them have different outputs. So all of them except for J and L have the same next states and the same outputs. So you can use H as the prototypic example, and you can get rid of I, K, M, N, and P, and you can replace them with H. And you make those substitutions down here. We'll just get rid of them here. And then for the J, uh, you can you can replace any any references for of L with J. So then the way this works, we're going to eliminate these, and then we're going to eliminate the L. And then we're going to we're going to place these uh, in, and that once you do that, now you reinspect it to see if there are any additional uh, redundant states, where states that have the same outputs and the same next states. So we notice that D has now H and H, G has also H and H, and that E has J and H, and F now has J and H. So we can replace. Uh, D, G with D and F with E. So we make those changes and now we inspect it again to see if there are more opportunities and it looks like now th that we're done. We can't see any other uh, redundant states so we assume that that's the end of that. Okay so these are uh, th these are really just the simplest case of equivalent states and again, it's unique to where the circuit resets after a fixed number of inputs. Um, once we get this done, now we can do an implication table. And this is how the implication table works. You should remember this, where we basically build this kind of, we cut a checkerboard in half, and uh, we, we put, so we have, and in here the states are with letters. Normally we use letters for flip-flops, but here they did states. Instead of S0, S1, they did ABC. And notice how, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight states, but we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven rows, and we have seven columns. And we start our columns with B, but we start our rows, or we start our rows with B, but our columns with A, because there's no reason to have A uh, compared to A, because obviously they're the, they're the same state. And what we're doing here then is we we do this table. And we first say, okay, if A is equivalent to B, what would have to be true? Well, if A is equivalent to B, then the outputs would have to be the same, and D would have to be the same as F, and C would have to be the same as H. So we write that in, D equals F, C equals H. And then we compare um, A to C. Well, the outputs are different, so we already know that, that, you, that A and C cannot be equivalent. Um, and then we compare A to D, so that's possible. So what would have to be true? Well, first off, uh, if you compare A to D, 
A and D would have to be equal. Well, that's that's already the comparison we're proposing, so we don't have to write that in the box. We can that's that's assumed because we have A compared to D in their chart. But the other thing that would have to be true is uh, C would have to equal would have to be equivalent to E. So we write C equals E. <coughs> <coughs> And then we compare A to E. Well, they have different outputs, so you, they, they won't be equivalent. A to F, different outputs, they won't be equivalent. A to G. For A to be equal G, D has to equal B, and C has to equal H. So we put both of those conditions in there. And again, A to H, uh, different outputs, so we can skip that. And we do this for the entire chart. Then we compare B to C to D to E, F, G, and H, and then we compare C to D, E, F, G, and H, and so forth. And finally, when it's all done, we put an X through every place where we know it can't be equivalent because of differences in outputs. And then once we get done with that, uh, we go back and we look and we see. So In this square, we, we said, well, is A equivalent to B? Well, if that's true, then D, and F, D has to equal F and C has to equal H. So then we look and see, could D equal F? Well, we find D down here and we see, oh, look, D and F have different outputs, so that can't be true. So now we can cross out A and B. And we keep doing that. We keep crossing out additional things based on the incompatibility of the outputs um, and once or, or whatever, or we've already crossed out over another, uh, we've already crossed it out, so we know that that can't be true. And eventually we wind up uh, where we can't cross anything else out. And when that happens, then then we then we um, realize that there's uh, some possibility that, or, well, we then we ascribe the equivalence to the remaining states that cannot be ruled out. And then we can substitute those in and, and uh, take another look. All right. Let me just talk about equivalent state assignments. This is uh, this probably was confusing to you when we did it. I hope not. But but the whole idea here is that um, that there are if you just if you just do three state and four state assignments, there are 24 different ways you can assign these states, which sh is shocking. I don't even know how that can be true, but apparently it is. Um, so um, but of those, there there are only there are only three that don't work out to uh, non-equivalent assignments. So what we mean by that is, if you did the assignments, well, well first off, why, why do we even care about looking at different ways to, to, to divide up, uh, let, let's say for three states or four states, we're gonna have two flip-flops, right? So why would, we, why would we look at all the different ways you can assign the two flip-flops um, to the states? And, and the question and the answer is, well, you know, I, the, the only reason you'd want to look at that is if there's a difference in, in the hardware it takes to implement the design. And it turns out there might be, not necessarily guaranteed that there will be, but there might be. So you want to define the assignment that would have the, the, small, the, the least amount of hardware. Well, to do that, um, to do that then, we need to have, um, we, we need to, um, we would find that there are quite a few states that although the, the hardware may, uh, that, that for instance, uh, you might have, say, two AND gates on, on uh, the A flip-flop input uh, and an OR gate, and then just just one OR gate on the B flip-flop, but then in, an, in another assignment, you might have uh, one OR gate on the A flip-flop, two AND gates, and one OR gate on the B flip-flop. So essentially, it's exactly the same amount of hardware. It's just switched, but it, it doesn't really change uh, what it takes to build the circuit. And that's what they mean by non-equivalent. So, so if, if they're equivalent assignments, then the, the overall amount of hardware would be the same. And the, the, there's been a lot of work going in to prove that this is true. And when you boil it all down, of these 24 possible ways to assign um, uh, three states and four states, uh, there's only three unique ways that result in actual different amounts of hardware. And here they are, and they're very simple to figure out. Uh, it's easier to think of the four states. So it's just 0, 1, 2, 3, straight binary order, 0, 1, 3, 2, and 0, 3, 1, 2. 
So you take the, th the three state and you just move it up uh, one notch each time. And that's, that covers all possible non-equivalent non assignments with, with three or four states. Um, here you just leave out the last state and it's a don't care anyway. Um, the problem is when you get to uh, when you get to higher order states, you jump into very big numbers very very quickly, and I, I'll show you the um, yeah. Let me pull up the text real quick. I'll show you that. It's truly amazing. Let's see what we'll it. So here's the. Uh, Here's the, the logic design text, and I think it's here. So it actually, we probably have to go backwards. So here it is. So um, I don't know if you can see this. I'll blow it up a little bit. So if you have if you have two or th if you have well if you have two states, there's only there's only uh, one distinct assignment. There's no reason to even think about that. If you have three or four, there are three different distinct assignments, non-equivalent. If you have five states, there's 140 non-equivalents. If you have six, there's 420. If you have seven and or eight, there's 840. And then when you hit nine states, you go to 10 million uh, non-equivalent or distinct assignments. And by the time you get to 16 states, you're up to 5.5 .5 times 10 to the 10th. I mean, it's crazy. So you, you certainly can look at, at three states, uh, three state assignments, and work them completely out and see what the hardware looks like. I suppose in an extreme case, you could maybe go through 140. 420 would make most people pull their hair out. 840 is ridiculous, and 10 million is not possible. So, so whenever we have very many states, we're already uh, essentially prohibited from really doing this. Uh, from looking at all possible distinct assignments and seeing which one might be smaller to work working those completely out so what what we do instead we have rules and uh and so that's we're going to talk about those rules now um we just cancel this and go all right so here are here are uh so we're going to look at these rules so um for a larger number of states, we just have to use these rules or guidelines. They're really guidelines, not so much rules. And we use this concept of adjacent states. What we mean by that is, uh, let's say you have uh, f three flip-flops. So, so state one, state zero with flip-flops uh, for state zero being A prime, B prime, C prime, and for state one being A prime, B prime, C, then they would be adjacent because they would only differ by a single change in variable. So normally, since all the boxes on a K-map uh, that are horizontally and vertically touching and wrap around, these only differ by one variable, we often use a K-map to assign these states just because it, it makes it easy to do the adjacent uh, thing and you can do it graphically. Um, so, um, you can also use the uh, don't cares to reduce the number of states. And um, so, so you should really look at, at different assignments using the don't cares and just a number of features. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I thought I had the rules here. Yeah, here are the rules. So here are the rules to sort of guide state assignment. States with the same next state should have adjacent assignments, which means they should only differ by a single variable. States that are the next states of the same state should have adjacent assignments. And states with the same outputs uh, can reduce the output uh, uh, hardware if they have adjacent assignments. All right, so that's the, those are the guidelines. Um, again, with, with complex programmable logic devices or field programmable gate arrays like we're using on our Nexus boards, uh, there you can you typically can go ahead and do one hot state assignment and see and and see if that uh, helps you uh, with timing or helps you with uh, reducing logic um, because those already exist. This wouldn't necessarily be useful if you're making a uh, uh, an integrated circuit from scratch because you'd have to create these extra flip flops 
So that might not be a good strategy in that case, but uh, but it might help you uh, on a uh, uh, CPLD or FPGA uh, implementation. All right. Um, we talked about iterative design before. Now here's how we do. Uh, we can take it. We can create a an adder uh, by taking four uh, full adders with one bit of A, one bit of B, a carry in, and one sum and one carry out bit, and hooking them together, daisy chaining them into a four bit adder. Um, so you can think of iterative design as essentially a a, a uh, sequential design in space as opposed to in time like a normal sequential design is. Um, and that's a reasonable way to think about it. We do have to think about uh, when we look at these cells here we know the information has to proceed from low order to high order and one bit must be passed from cell to cell. But if you do something like a comparator you notice that the information uh, there's actually three possibilities a greater than, less than, and equal. And so you have to send uh, two bits of information and it goes from high order to low order. So it, it moves in a left to right uh, manner, if you will. You can convert these, these, uh, these parallel series circuits to sequential circuits and make, them, uh, and, and make them do a bit at a time and work in time. Now, certainly this is gonna make them a little slower so uh, where you would apply this would be where you can run this, this, this fast enough that it's not going to cause any problems with your overall timing concerns. Here's a comparator. Uh, you start off with the assumption that everything's equal, and then you compare the high order bit. You have to do the high order bit first. It won't work in reverse, because uh, if the high order bits differ, then you've already established either A is greater than B or B is greater than A, they can't be equal anymore. And it doesn't, and the lower bits, the lower order bits make absolutely no difference. It doesn't matter what they are. It only matters what that high order bit is. So you start them off as equal, and the first bit you find that's different, then you're done. And you can, uh, you can uh, conclude that's the, that's the end. Because additional bits won't change it. Uh, lower order bits will never change it. Um, all right, and uh, when you if you compare two uh, n-bit binary numbers x and y, again you start with the most significant bits. You only have three possibilities: either they're equal, or x is going to be a one and y a zero, or x is going to be a zero and y a one. And if they're both zeros or both ones, then they're equal. So those are the four conditions, and but there's really only three possibilities: equal, greater than, or less than. And again, once you become greater than, you'll never become equal or less than again for that, for that particular set of comparisons. Um, you have to see how many bits must be uh, sent from one cell to cell, and you have to see which direction they have to go. All right, uh, here's the four-bit adder, and uh, this just goes through a little iterative design of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I'm not even going to ask you about it, but here's an adder. It uses uh, one flip-flop to hold the carry bit to pass from from uh, full adder to full adder, and it uh, it uses uh, some fancy circuitry to uh, to read the two add end uh, bits and then uh, store the sum back in uh, one of these registers and store the carry in this flip-flop. Okay, do uh, so uh, with our iterative design. Um, we we just we just work it the same way as we, we would um, if we're converting this into a sequential design. We would do it the same way we would do any sequential design. We'd set up the state table, the st state graph, state table, transition table, flip flop input equations, and then hook everything up. Um, Here's what a comparator's, single comparator cell looks like. Um, if we do a sequential design with ROMs, this is a, a very straightforward way to do it. This is basically how, the, how our FPGA will uh, implement them pretty much. We use the ROM to implement the combinational portion, and then we add the number of flip-flops needed to hold the sequential portion. Now, you, don't, you can uh, define a flip-flop and have it sort of theoretically create the flip-flops for you, uh, 
but in the FPGA, they pretty much already exist. So what we'd rather do is just create a vector. Uh, that vector uh, is immediately assigned to flip-flops to, to house it, and you don't really have to get then into the flip-flop details. Um, and if you do get into details and you start creating uh, uh, sets and clears for all the flip-flops, then on our chip you create quite a problem because there you can only have a, you can only have one or the other uh, conveniently uh, if you want them both and it, and it takes a fair amount of hardware to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you can set it up as a mealy or more. The ROM is addressed by the inputs and the current state, which is represented by the flip flops, and the outputs of the ROM drive the next state by driving the flip flop inputs and then also generate whatever, however many outputs you might have. And um, so, Okay, so um, so if we're going to use the ROM, the way this works, we normally do uh, we normally go ahead and and, and uh, so for the like for the code converter problem. So we have seven states. Okay, so that means three flip flops. So you have to have an output for each of the D inputs for all three flip flops, and so that means you have three columns for that. You have. Uh, you you have to, you have uh, three bits that are encoding the states, so you have to input three bits for the current state. You have one input, so that's another bit, so that's four bits, and then you have one output function. So you have besides the three flip flop uh, D inputs that come out, you have one output. Okay, so let's let me um, let me let's set that up so that you can. So I'll show you what I, I'll draw that out. That probably makes more sense. So let's switch the camera and we'll just draw it because this is important. And we're going to do a lab that talks about this. So hopefully that'll be um, fairly straightforward. So all right, and then we'll get rid of this. So. Okay, this is, I don't know how to get this stupid thing. All right, so, ah, <clears throat> close all. Okay, and then we'll bring up, well, I thought it was up, sorry. And I can't even see what I'm doing, which is equally bad. One note. Maybe I should I should create a new one. I just haven't done that yet. All right. So yeah, I should have paused the video. All right. So here we are. So so basically, you can think of your ROM like this, okay? And it's got it's got some number of rows. The number of rows is determined by the number of inputs. And then it has some number of columns. And in this case, so that's some number of outputs. Now, the the uh, the number of inputs. If the number of inputs equals n, then you would have two to the n rows. So what are our inputs? Well, we have we have to have the current state. And we have to have uh, the next input. So here's your system over here. 
you have an input X and you have an output Z and um, so so you have to account but you also have the state so the state is three bits and the input is one bit so now that gives you that gives you four inputs R n equals four so now you have 16 rows and um, and four bits of address now for the outputs you have to have one output that's the, the output Z and then you have to have uh, three outputs for your new flip-flop so we can we can we can get rid of we can get rid of one of these columns so you have the DA the DB and the D uh, C so those are the flip-flop inputs uh, and the uh, so and then what do you have to have besides this besides this you have to have three flip-flops because the flip-flops hold the current state so what happens then is so you have say three flip-flops here a b c and here are the d inputs and of course they all have clocks and and so and then they all have out they have outputs too so so the the outputs of the flip-flops the cues the cues go in as three of the inputs and the X is one more input so that's your four inputs here those are your address lines they decode into 16 rows and then at each row you have the desired next state um, based on that input so so basically you can with one input you pair the rows up so you have one set of one row for the next input being a zero and another row for the input being a one and then you have the three outputs that these go to the three D inputs and then this this row goes uh, sorry this row generates the output for Z all right so hopefully that makes it a little clear so when we specify a, a ROM there are several things we specify. We specify the number of rows, columns, and then we also would specify the number of address lines, which of course that's going to equal our number of independent variables and our rows are going to equal 2 to the n. The columns just have to equal the number of outputs needed. And they often, uh, well, in our FPGA, we usually have just one output for each truth table, and that that's our typical LUT six. It just has a single output, but it has, it has, but it has uh, n independent variables. It has six independent variables, so it actually has 64 rows. So that's actually pretty amazing. So, okay, so let's go back to this. And we'll move this back over here. Um, and I guess I'm moved or something. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's that's how we create a uh, um, a state machine with a ROM. Remember, you still have to have the external flip-flops, and we're going to do that. We're going to do a lab exactly this way. We're going to do it with a ROM. Uh, we'll do it with, and and uh, some the external flip-flops, and then we'll do it with the equations, and also the external flip-flops. You don't actually have to. We you could create a module that's a D flip-flop, and then you could instantiate that three times, or you could just like you could, or you could just create a three-bit vector, uh, which would effectively automatically. Uh, create three flip-flops to hold those, those values. 
So it's kind of interesting. The synthesizer is there to do a lot of work for you if you let it. Okay. Um, so then this is the transition table. So here are your, here are your three flip-flops, A, B, C. This is your current state. This is your input X and your desired next state for X equals zero, given that you're in state zero, and your desired next state for X equals one, given that you're in state zero. If you're in state one, here are the desired next states. If you're in state two, here are the desired next states. If you're in state three, here they are. Four, here they are. And then we have uh, for five these. And then for six, we have one for x equals zero. But for x equals one, it's a don't care. And then one, 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 we have don't cares. Likewise for the outputs. And then you can just create, here's your, here's your truth table. So now notice, in this case, we don't do k-maps, and we don't we don't we don't have to uh, minimize these equations. We don't have to generate the equations. We don't have to minimize them. All we have to do basically is extract this information and and put it into put it into the ROM. Now, what are the so again? What are the what are going to be the address lines for the ROM? The address lines for the ROM are going to be the current state and the and the input x. What are going to be the outputs? The outputs are going to be the desired next states and the output. And so here we have we have four inputs to the ROM, the the input to the system X, the current states for ABC, and then we have the output of the system Z, and the next state desired next states, which will be the the flip flop inputs. These will this will be the DA. This will be the DB, this will be the DC inputs. So that's how that works. Okay. Um, and you can see the ROM is pretty useful when the number of don't cares is pretty small. If, on the other hand, you had lots and lots of don't cares, then you could probably you could probably simplify this greatly and you could implement with some gates and uh, and and save the money that the ROM is going to cost you because the ROM is going to be more expensive than than a few simple gates especially if you're creating this on a brand new integrated circuit on the other hand if you're doing using an FPGA no point losing any sleep because that's how it's going to be implemented in the FPGA it's going to be implemented you're going to have uh, <clears throat> they'll set up um, they'll set up uh, four lookup tables and they're going to use LUT6s because that's what they've got. They can maybe divide them up a little bit. I can't remember. I think I think they kind of are stuck with a LUT6. So so basically then you're going to uh, use a LUT6 for Z, for A, A+, plus, B+, plus, and C+. Plus. So there'll be four of them. And you'll have a bunch of rows that will just be replicated because you don't have six variables. You only got four. So there'll be some a lot of redundant rows, and the, or maybe they'll just tie the two unused variables high, and they'll just use those rows. But in any event, there'll be wasted space in the LUT6. Okay, and here it is. Here are the three flip-flops. Here are the inputs, the current uh, input X, and the current state of ABC. So these ABCs, A, this A is driving A, this is driving B, this is driving C. It's just the current state of the flip-flops. And then here's the D inputs. That's the DA. The A plus is the DA. The B plus is the DB. The C plus is the DC. And the Z is just the output. All right. Um, so CPLDs, uh, we'll talk about this more. So I'm probably go through this a little bit. But uh, Complex programmable logic devices use macro cells. It's kind of like a mini FPGA, and a FPGA is kind of like a, a CPLD on years and years of steroids. They're, the FPGAs are much, much, much bigger than the CPLDs in terms of their capacity. Size-wise, they're not all that different. Um, okay, and uh, I don't... I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to talk a lot about adders anyway, and nobody's ever going to use one like this. This would, this is, this this is you know 
much slower than a fully parallel adder. And we're going to really look at adders that are going to be faster. Um, so speed's really an issue when it comes to adders. For four bits, a slow adder could probably be tolerated, but because uh, it's not going to drag it down that bad. But if you have 64 bits like this, this would be a killer. It would take 64 clock cycles to get a result, and and you just can't afford that kind of that kind of drag on your computing power. So for anything really you know intense. All right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this really. I think I'll skip over this. Uh, and then here's the multiplier. Multiplier, multipliers uh, are also implemented with adders. Remember, everything comes down to adders. Multipliers, subtractors, dividers, adders. All adders. Everything comes down to adders. And so uh, having very high speed addition is super important for any, you know, uh, for the performance of any processor. Okay, um, so now we can't, now, you know, when, when I say it's based on adders, we, we do have dedicated hardware multipliers, but they're made up of adders, and you're going to see that. We're going to look at an array multiplier, and you're, and you're going to see it's all adders is what it is. You, 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 generate, uh, you generate the partial products, um, and remember, in binary math, the partial products are either all zeros or it's just the multiplicand based on the multiplier digit. And then you keep shifting and shifting and you either copy zeros or copy the multiple can and then you add up the, the partial products. So it's really adding up the partial products that, 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 that is the intense operation. Generating the partial products is simple because they're, they're either a copy of the multiple can exactly or they're zeros. And all they are is indexed for each additional multiplier bit. All right. And so here's, a, here's the state graph for the multiplier. So you design a little sequential machine to, to drive this thing. Uh, again, we're not going to do that. All right. SM charts. So we're going to finish up with this. So uh, SM charts are state machine charts. And it's, uh, another name for sequential circuit is just a state machine. So these are, these are definitely uh, useful. Uh, they're very useful in the designing of uh, sequential circuits. And they, they, they really they make, it, they make some of the computational overhead much easier. Uh, they may take away some of the ability to simplify some of the circuits because you usually don't take into account the don't cares. Um, a state graph is a, is a behavioral description of a sequential circuit, but an SM chart is just a, little, just a bit more formal and allows you to, uh, to actually write the equation straight off the SM chart. So how does this work? Well, so, uh, so there, you can argue that, that an SM chart is a little easier to comprehend than, uh, than a state graph because it's, it's made up of, it's more regimented. So you have uh, three different boxes that can appear uh, in, uh, in, a, in a SM chart. And an SM chart is made up of one block for each state. Each block must have a state box, which is a square, and only one. And every block must have one. So, so a state box is the only mandatory item, and it must be in every single state. Now, if there are decisions to be made within that state, then, then you would put decision boxes. And you can have a bunch of those if you want, or just one or none. And then our conditional outputs, these are only present if we have mealy outputs. If there are no mealy outputs, we don't have any of these. And all the outputs are associated with the state box in each state. But if you have mealy outputs, then they have to be in conditional output boxes associated with link paths through the state. Every, every, state, every, every block for, for a given state, each state block, has to have only one entrance path. So all, all paths from other blocks have to come in through one path. You can have a number of different exit paths. And, uh, and they, they would typically then go to different places, different next states. Um, all right. 
And you, with inside the state box, you can have multiple link paths active at the same time as long as they all wind up going out the same exit path. You cannot have multiple exit paths active at the same time. Only one exit path can be active, but it could be driven by several different entrance paths. That, that would be legal. And we call this path through the block a link path. So here's an example. Um, so, so here's a, you can actually represent this, this exact same circuit. We'll call it state S0. Here's our state box, and here's our state box, both S0, and we have Z1 as an output associated with that state. Here, we've lined things up in a, in a very uh, sequential way, or a very uh, serial way, and here we've lined it up in a very parallel way. Now, what you would notice, though, is that there's only one exit path out of both of these blocks. So it, that's, that's what comes into play, then, is you can have multiple uh, multiple link paths active. So you could have a path going through each one of these three decision blocks coming down here and coming out the same path. That would be legal. Here you can have the same thing. You have only one really link path, but it could it it could variously, depending on X1, X2, and X3, choose to go through Z3, Z4, Z5, or whatever. Uh, Z4, Z5, Z2, Z4, 3, 2, I guess. 2, 3, 4. You could, you could have it come to X1 and skip Z4, but then go to X2 and go to Z3 and then X3, and it could go through Z, Z2. And so you'd only have, you still only have um, it exiting at the same point. Now in this case, it wouldn't make it, you know, obviously when you get to this decision box, you can't go, you wouldn't go both ways. You're only gonna go one way here. But the link path could be complicated. You could go down here, through this one and through that one and then out and this would be a more of a serial more of a serial way to do it this would be a parallel way to do it but but they would result in the exact same outputs so it's just a way to visualize it differently okay here's an sm chart um, and um so we have we have uh we have some more outputs and some melee outputs in this chart Notice that we have a uh, more output associated with S0, and it's ZA. We have another one associated with S1, it's ZB, and another one with S2, that's ZC. So those, those ZA, ZB, and ZC are more outputs, and they're only associated with the state, and they're good until we're switched to the next state. But some of our uh, links do have other outputs that are melees. So if you happen to be in state S2 and you get a 1, then you're going to output Z2. Otherwise, Z2 is going to be 0. And if you output, if you get a 0, you're going to output Z1. Otherwise, Z1 is going to be 0. Uh, when, it, when we write the Z1 here, that assumes that Z1 is, is a 1. When we write Z2 here, it assumes that means that for this path, Z2 would be 1. For all other paths, since it's not specified, Z, Z1 would be 0, and also Z2 would be 0. And ZA is only 1 when you're in S0, and it's 0 everywhere else. S1, uh, ZB, is only zero uh, is only 1 when you're in S1, everywhere else 0. And ZC is only 1 when you're in S2, and everywhere else it's 0. So that's how you interpret these. When you see the variable, it means it's 1. And we don't have to write Z equals 1. We just know that's what it means. Now here's what it looks like in the SM chart. Notice you have the two conditional outputs down here, Z1 and Z2, that correspond with the two melee outputs here. And then you have the, the, three state, the three more outputs that are associated with each of these state boxes. So when you're in S0, you output a ZA. When you're in S1, you output ZB. When you're in S2, you output ZC. And you have these decision boxes. All right, the red lines uh, def kind of determine the blocks. It was easier to draw the lines after I created the blocks. Uh, so they're not clean, but notice every, every, state, every, every block has a state box here and here and here. Every state box only has one entry point, but there could be multiple exit points. Um, so this one has two exits. This one has two exits. This one has two exits. They pretty much they they have two exits because 
because uh, uh, you only have one input, so you only have to have two paths out of each node, essentially, just like in the state graph. But notice here, if, you, if x is a 1, you're going to output conditional output, the melee output z2, it's going to be a 1, and then you're going to come out and back in to the same state. And you're required to leave the, the state box and re-enter, or the block, re leave the block and re-enter. And again, there should only be one path in. So there's the one path, here's the one path, here's the one path in. But there's two paths out of every one of these blocks. Okay, um, so we've kind of done this summary a couple of times. Basically, you model the problem statement, you do a block diagram, some simple input and, and, and desired output sequences. Uh, then you can draw an SM chart or a state graph or a state table, depending on which is easier. Convert it to a state table, or in the case of the state uh, SM chart, you can just go ahead and, and, uh, and assign the, uh, the, the state encodings, and you can start writing the equations. And we'll do that here in a minute. Uh, if you're going with the state table, then you do flip-flop state assignment, create the transition table, and then move it off to KMAPs or some other simplification uh, s software, and then you implement using uh, uh, using hardware description language. Uh, if you're going to do an FPGA or an ASIC, or uh, if you're going to build a chip from scratch, and then you test it. Usually, especially if you're building chips, you're going to do a lot of simulation before you commit to that to those that final design. Okay, that's pretty much the whole review, um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I think that that should pretty much do it. So we will do the little bit of test on Wednesday. Um, yeah, I encourage you to just, you can review the slides. I, I, I think they're available. I'll just double check that. Um, and, um, and hopefully then, uh, and then we'll take the test on, uh, uh, on uh, Wednesday. So go ahead and study and kind of get ready, and we'll talk to you later. And, and Wednesday, I won't do a lecture, so we'll just have the test to do.